evening and welcome to Real Talk, where every Sunday night we offer insight, education, and resources to in-home caregivers and those affected in their world. These are the children, the parents, the extended family, and everyone who loves them. And our goal is to offer real-life topics and learning through discussing real issues and offering real solutions. And tonight, I'm very excited to welcome our guest, Lauren Bucci, who is the director of a school counseling program and a holistic pediatric sleep specialist. As a sleep specialist, her mission is to provide education for parents on what normal sleep looks like so they can manage their expectations for those early days. She also enjoys helping parents get more sleep without using sleep training methods. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second while keeping emotion and attachment at the forefront. She has also been drawn to helping others and after becoming a mom, realized that there was a big gap in education surrounding normal infant sleep and the value of a mother's intuition. She has 12 years of experience in working to support mental health first in adults, then children, and now in mothers and babies. And tonight, we're gonna dig into an aspect of that. And we're gonna dig into this whole concept of holistic sleep and what that looks like because there's so many misconceptions out there. So before we dig into that, Lauren, I would love it if you could tell us really kind of if there was like one thing that really spurred your passion to get you into this. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, really, before I had, so I have a daughter, she's 22 months old. And before I had her, I had um, no interest and no background in working in the sleep field. Um, but after I had her, I realized that I had absolutely no clue about biologically normal infant sleep. Um, I had a lot of people sharing, um, you know, their own opinions and things like that. But my daughter went through a pretty significant <laughs> four month sleep progression uh, where she was pretty wakeful. And I, at that time, decided I really needed to learn more about what she was going through and how I could help support her and how to help, how to listen to my instincts and kind of drown out what other people were sharing with me because she was her own unique baby. Um, mm -hmm. So at that point, I enrolled in the uh, certification class and learned everything I could to know about on um, biologically normal infant sleep and why babies wake and the importance of responding. And yeah, here I am today. Fabulous. And I love, love that you said four months sleep progression. Yeah. Because it makes me crazy when everybody calls it a regression. Yeah. But absolutely. well, sleep may not be what you were expecting, but it's actually a normal part of the process and it means everything's going well. Um, so that's a term I actually use. Uh, and people think I'm crazy, but yeah. that's okay. Um, yeah. You know what? I don't mind challenging the cultural norm. So yeah. let's talk about this. But first, I um, already told you I wanted to ask about this. Let's talk about sleep training as a terminology because it there's so many things that are thrown under that term, most of them negative, um, and sometimes negative for a good reason. So share with us what you mean around that and, and what that is. Yes. When I say that I um, help parents get more sleep without using sleep training methods, I'm really referring to those separation-based or behavioral-based methods where we're trying to either um, change the behavior uh, or extinction, you know, that way, or trying to use separation to um, get the baby to sleep longer. Um, because I really focus so heavily on attachment, I know that separation is the number one threat to that attachment relationship. So I personally don't work with any separation-based methods, but I do help parents make changes. Um, you know, maybe around six, seven, eight months, they no longer want to breastfeed to sleep, or they want to change um, from bouncing to sleep to putting baby down into the crib and just rubbing their back. And that will definitely involve crying. And I help parents figure out how to make a plan, but to support their baby through it while staying present with them and supporting the emotion, as opposed to using those like separation based cry it out or fervor type methods. Fantastic. I love to get that distinction out there. Um, because there's so much misinformation and terminologies just thrown around and people don't always know. So I want to make sure everybody's clear on exactly what you're talking to. So let's talk about biologically normal sleep. For years, that's not a term we ever heard at all, but it's coming to the forefront. We're starting to get more information. So talk to us about that. What are people supposed to expect? 
Yes, it's such a good question. Also such a loaded question because I feel like I could sit here and talk about, you know, wake windows and sleep totals and sleep progressions and cat naps and all the things that are very developmentally normal. But what I love to share with parents, especially clients when I work with them, is that human babies are born with only 25% of that adult brain intact. This compared to like other primates, all other primates in the world are born with 60 to 90% of that adult brain. So human babies are actually born so incredibly immature and they complete their gestational period on the outside. So, you know, they're in their mother's stomach for, for 40 weeks. A lot of people understand, okay, that's a gestational period, but human babies are considered exterior gestators, meaning they come out and they need um, an environment that matches the womb. So they have, they need warmth, touch, you know, lots of holding and snuggling and feed, feeding and food and all of that. Um, and so I love to share that because a lot of parents come to me and they're like, my baby never wants to be put down when they, when I put, they fall asleep in my arms and I put them down and they wake back up and I'm like, okay, yes, that's because they're still completing that gestational period and they need all of that love. So our babies are biologically designed to actually be, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> to be wakeful. And there is a reason for that. Um, well, there's multiple reasons, which I won't get into all of them. Um, but one of them is that waking in the night and not falling into a deep sleep, especially for our very young babies, is actually a protective factor against SIDS. We don't want them in a very long, deep period of sleep for a really long time. Another reason that babies wake frequently is because their stomach is itty bitty. So they can only take on so much food and then they need to wake and eat again. So um, I always tell parents, tune into your unique baby. Every baby is different. I know babies that come out and they are sleeping longer periods. And then we have babies that come out and they sleep, you know, very short periods. Maybe they want the swaddle, they don't. They're comfortable in the bassinet, they're not. If you can really try to tune out what everyone else is sharing about their baby, whether you're a caregiver or a parent, follow your instincts and tune into what your baby is, is um, sharing with you and have low expectations about what is going to happen with sleep in those first few months. I feel like that really sets parents up uh, for, for a good start. Yeah, I agree. And that's one of the things oftentimes, um, just like two days ago, somebody said, oh, well, you know, that's all just part of having a new baby. And I was like, no, if we pay attention, or as you call it, tuning in, but if we really pay attention, babies show us what their needs are. And if we meet those needs, unless there's something else going on, if there's a medical issue or it, right. you know, there's a neurological concern or whatever that we may not know about. If we pay attention, if we tune in, I love that phrase, <laughs> um, to what they're telling us and then respond, it solves a whole lot of problems. But society tells us, oh, you're not supposed to respond. Oh, right. they have to learn to be independent. They have to, you know, uh, Absolutely. we go on. We oh yeah, hours, and right? I always say like we're, we're pushing independence on newborns who are actually still in that gestational period. So I feel mm -hmm. like when parents learn that or caregivers learn that information, you know, they feel so much more confident in what they're choosing to do. Right. So that push for independence is cultural. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, because a lot of our society expectations on adults demands that as well. We understand that. We don't, we want to acknowledge that. Right. But you and I both know that there's a need, there's a concern with that independence. So let's flip the switch and let's talk about attachment yeah. and what that need is. Why, why is it? Why do babies or how do babies attach to their caregivers in their first year in particular? Yeah, I think that's such a good question, especially because I know so many um, you know, parents of this generation who are like, I want to have strong attachment with my baby. I was one of those people, but I didn't really understand how that happened. And so what is so important to know is that babies attach to their caregivers. And that doesn't just mean parents. It doesn't, it could be anyone who's caring for them through the senses. So sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. Um, they are using their senses to attach and they feel the most, the safest and most secure when in sensory proximity to that caregiver. Um, so again, when we have a baby that wants to nurse frequently, when we have the baby that wants to be worn or doesn't want to be put down. Um, I, I've just, I have so many parents come to me and say like, what am I doing wrong? What's wrong with my baby? But there isn't anything wrong. They're literally attaching to you. 
Um, sometimes the question I get is, okay, well, if my baby's attaching to me as the parent, can they attach to others as well? And the question is, yes, they are going to use their senses to attach for anyone who's taking care of them. They might have their primary attachment and then their attachments that go on from there. Um, but yeah, it's just so important to know that when we're holding and loving and snuggling on our babies, we're actually helping build that attachment relationship. And I also like to tell parents that it doesn't mean that you can never, or caregivers, that you can never separate from your baby. It's not that you must hold them every second for the entire first year, but we need to think about, okay, so they're, they need continuous connection. That's just what my baby needs. So they need to sense you. So maybe you put that baby down in the other room or maybe in the same room, you're not holding them, but you're singing to them while you're doing the dishes. You have to get something done but you're still providing them that sound. They're still connecting through to you through that way. Maybe you sleep with their pajamas or their swaddle for a few nights and it smells like you. And then you put that swaddle or that, those pajamas on the baby. And the baby is attaching to you through smell. There are literally hundreds of ways for babies to attach to their caregivers. And there is no one way. So I know sometimes out there, there's information like, well, if you don't baby wear, or you don't breastfeed, um, then you can't have attachment. You know, you're, you're not following the rules of attachment. This is not true. There is no one way. Again, tuning into your baby and figuring out what works for you. Hundreds of ways to attach um, and to build that, you know, as a caregiver or as a parent. I love that you shared that there's more than one way because you're right. The prevailing concept that we hear a lot of times is, oh, you have to baby wear or you have to nurse, or you, whatever it is, we hear that you have to. And we are so busy telling parents, essentially all the things they're doing wrong, yeah. that we don't look at the other things. So the fact that there are lots of different ways to do that and lots of different senses to do that, I think maybe gives hope to some of those parents and caregivers out there that there's different ways it can work. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about attachment, right? Attachment is, that connection, connections usually are tied to emotion. So how does this emotion, that attachment, all of those things, how do we support that? And does that have any impact on sleep? Yeah, so I love to also comment, you know, on attachment is that when we do have that attachment built, whether, you know, with the baby and the caregiver or baby and parent, the ultimate threat to attachment is separation. Um, and you can even think about that as an adult. If you've been in a relationship, what's the biggest threat? It's when you're being separated, maybe when you break up, those are the most difficult times. So for our babies who are attached to us, um, when we separate, so overnight or for a nap or just by putting them down, they're feeling that threat of, of separation. <clears throat> From there, you will probably see a large emotional uh, response. They're going to feel frustrated. They're going to have intense pursuit. They're going to be seeking out that connection with their caregiver, hence the emotion. So I always love to share about this because I think also in our society, it's often that we're like, emotion's bad. Don't show your emotion. If you're, you know, buttoned up, then you're doing really good in life where the actual, the truth is that emotion is good. Showing emotion, expressing emotion, actually helps our children to grow up. It helps babies accept the futility of a situation um, and come to acceptance and understanding sooner. It can also be a way for them to just get out of like a big emotional release, maybe of frustration. Sometimes babies need a really big cry before they can settle in for sleep at night. Um, sometimes emotion builds up all day. So I just love to share this because emotion is not the enemy. I think sometimes when we talk about that sleep training, parents are like, I want the no cry method. I don't, I don't want any crying involved. Crying alone by themselves without being comforted. Yes, I, that's not my favorite. But when we're able to hold and love and be there and support, even just validate, even our teeny tiny babies, like, I know this is hard for you. I see that you're frustrated. Providing that for them while they're expressing emotion can actually be so beneficial to their sleep. That's a big one for a lot of people to think about. It, is. it really is because we so often, we do, we encounter all the time. I want no crying or the opposite. Oh, just let them cry. Right. Um, I talked to somebody this past week that the doctor told the parents that they should just put their four week old baby down and let them cry. Ugh. And I was just like heartbroken. Yeah, uh, over that concept of just put them down, walk away and let them cry. Now, 
by that, I'm not saying if you're having a super frustrating moment as a parent, there's no harm in a one-time thing where you're like, I'm frustrated and angry. And right now I need to walk away. That's mm-hmm. different than abandoning them for night after night after night. Right. 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 Yeah, absolutely. And I have heard that too. And you absolutely, if you need a break, if you're frustrated, <clears throat> please walk away, you know, put them down in a safe place and take your five minutes. That is okay. Um, but it's when we say to parents, like once it's nighttime, we don't, we no longer respond to their needs. And I always am like, how is that different from daytime? I'm, I want to be there for, for my baby, you know, at all times of day. And sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll get into this, but how sometimes that'd be really hard. So how do we support through that? Um, but I always encourage parents, follow your instincts, do what your heart is telling you and respond to your baby. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny, I think about that because I've been in this industry for 35 plus years now. <laughs> we used to do that and we used to tell parents that. Yeah. But this falls into that absolute category of, you know, when you learn better, you do better. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, years ago, that is absolutely what we used to tell parents all the time because we thought it was the right thing to do. Right. Um, so based on that, I've made changes in what I do and what I advise parents to do as I've learned more. Yeah. Let's transition into that concept of making changes. Okay, I'm a parent. I understand. But, because I get that, I get all the time. I understand that, but how do I make some of these changes? Because dang, I need some sleep too. I haven't slept in months. How do we make changes in a positive way that don't have that negative impact of just complete separation and essentially abandonment? Right, absolutely. This is part of the most... uh important part of the work that I do with families is helping them make changes. And I love to talk about that because you'll often hear um, things like, well, don't beat the baby to sleep. Don't rock or bounce or do, don't do X, Y, and Z. And if you do those things, your baby will know, your, your child will oh, be doomed for a life of horrible sleep, um, which I have personal experience with and know it's not true. But sometimes maybe parents have you know, bounced baby to sleep, you know, you get into that, you're bouncing on the ball and it's worked until six months. And all of a sudden baby is 15 pounds and your back is killing you. And it's no longer working for you. That is okay. It doesn't make it a bad habit. It means that it was working for you and it no longer is. That's when I work with parents to help them make changes to sleep. Um, so, so, you know, in that case, we're bouncing baby to sleep. I always then talk to parents. Well, how do you want the baby to sleep? You just want them to go in the crib and you want to rub their back while you sing. Okay, great. So I, I talk parents through and we do a lot of information about that attachment and emotion, but we work through how do we support emotion? And sometimes for parents that can be really challenging. Maybe they grew up in a household where emotion wasn't welcomed. They've learned to push it down. And so supporting someone else's emotion can be very hard and triggering. So we always work through that. And so if you're a parent or you're a caregiver who's having to make some changes, expect that a large emotional release is coming. You might need to do some preparation work on your own end to be confident and comfortable in supporting those tears. Knowing that tears are not the enemy, tears actually help our children get to where we want them to be. So um, another example would be when parents choose to night wean. Maybe your baby's 18 months old and you're like, I can't do this anymore. We've got a night wean. There's definitely going to be a big emotional release from your child. Um, So preparing for those tears and then just supporting them, staying with them, validating them um, and letting them know I know this is a difficult time, but I'm holding my boundaries. This is what our new, you know, it's okay to have boundaries just because your child is crying. That is not, that is not wrong. Um, So yeah, it's just figuring out what is no longer working for you, figuring out what is going to work for you and then preparing for that emotional release. Yeah, I love that you brought that up saying that the tears aren't wrong. One of the things I tell parents sometimes is, look, when they're five years old and they want to eat ice cream, breakfast, lunch, dinner, everything in between, and it's literally the only food they want to eat, you're going to have to make a change. Mm -hmm. And they're likely going to protest. And protest often comes in the form of crying. Yeah. Uh, so the, an acknowledgement that that's reality is huge for parents sometimes. So I love that you do that. Yeah, it can be really hard. Even for myself, you know, I work in this work and sometimes I find myself, my daughter's crying and I just give her something. Mm-hmm. Even though I have said no, I'm like, oh wait, I know this is not what I'm trying to do, but sometimes those tears can be triggering for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's another thing. So that's a big one. I acknowledge the parents. Look, I'm a parent too. 
and I get it and I get how hard it is and I get how easy it is for me to stand on the outside and tell you what to do and how much harder it is when you're in the moment because I've been that parent who went okay fine just take it just don't cry anymore right yeah Yeah. I think I might still do that in their teenagers (laughs) on occasion but um one of the other things that we talk about so if we're being realistic about this and saying look using extinction is not a good method if you have a baby who does this because some babies naturally and organically sleep through the night fairly early on as long as they're growing everything's fine great but that's not reality for a lot of parents and it's not reality for a lot more of them than we acknowledge sometimes so let's talk reality If this is happening and if a parent wants to support biologically normal sleep and wants to support who their individual child is, Mm -hmm. the question becomes, how do I get any rest? How do I get any more sleep if I'm constantly responding? Because that's reality. That's, and we know lack of sleep is just as bad for adults as it is for anyone else. Right. Absolutely. Yes. It's, it's so important because while I'm, I'm talking through this and, you know, sharing with parents, so this is normal. They will be wakeful. I also want to acknowledge that I know that it's very difficult. I've been there personally, not that long ago. Um, and we went through those nights and we really had to figure out how we were going to survive. So some of the tips that I say, of course, you can't force your baby to sleep longer. That's not the goal. So how are we going to survive through it anyways? Um, leaning on your partner is the number one thing. If you're not a single parent and you do have that partner, I want to make sure sometimes it can be that mom is taking on a really, a lot of the responsibility because she's breastfeeding. So it's like, well, mom's just going to get up while dad sleeps all night and, or, or partner. And that is, um, fine, but the partner can still get up and help. So one of my favorite ways is that maybe the, the partner takes one or two of the night wakings, depending on how often this is happening. And the partner's the one when the baby starts crying, partner goes and gets the baby, brings over to mom to breastfeed. Mom's still basically half asleep. You know, she can do sideline breastfeeding or whatever works for her. But the partner's the one responsible for making sure baby is safe and, and all of that while mom basically just provides the food. And then the partner can take baby away, do the diaper changing, the burping and support baby back to sleep. So mom's not doing, you know, 30, 45 minutes of this. She's maybe involved for 10 minutes and back to sleep. Um, alternatively, sometimes parents like a moms like to pump for a night or for a, for a session so that the partner can wake up and do a bottle feeding without even having to disturb mom. Sometimes when we can get like a really good, just four hour chunk, that's so helpful for our feeling, you know, good the next day. So however, I, you know, there's so many different ways to do it. Sometimes this is what worked for my family is I did all the night wakings, but then as soon as my daughter woke in the morning, my husband would take her and I would go back to sleep for maybe up to three hours. Granted, my husband worked from home, this worked for us, um, but I really liked that morning time chunk of sleep. Mm -hmm. You can take shifts with your partner, whatever it is, making sure you're working with your partner to get as much sleep as you can possibly get. Um, also leaning on your village. So I say this all the time, but make sure you are building a village when you are pregnant and leaning on them when you have a baby. I had a friend come over um, and hold and be with my baby for four hours from eight to midnight so that my husband and I could just both get one solid chunk of sleep um, in the four month progression days when she was pretty wakeful. Um, So depending on other people, if you uh, have the ability to hire on someone else, if you do have a childcare provider, having them come over, you know, during the day so you can sleep for two, three hours um, or having someone help you with the household tasks, especially in those newborn days when baby is sleeping, especially during the day, I mean, day and night, you should be sleeping as well. So how else you can try to get those household tasks done. Maybe your partner does them when he comes home, but really prioritizing your sleep is the most essential thing. The household tasks and everything else that needs to get done comes later. Um, On top of that, those are really my, my main things is leaning on your partner, leaning on your village and making sure that sleep is the number one thing that you're focusing on. Yeah, some great answers there. And I know that as a, when I was a new parent, that was one of the things we did um, is that my husband would get up for every waking, change oh. the diaper, bring the baby to me. I would feed and he would then turn around, soothe him, put him back to sleep. So that I didn't have to physically get out of bed unless I wanted to. Right. Um, and it was a game changer. And people were like, oh, you're so lucky. And I was like, 
no, actually we were really intentional about that. Yeah. And he wanted to be an equal part of the, this process um, and it allowed him to bond with his child, yeah. um, which is great. I, and I love also that you talk about getting a solid chunk of sleep here and there um, and that support isn't always somebody taking care of the baby because you mentioned, you know, sleep, prioritize sleep, sleep when your baby sleep. But if you're like me and your kitchen is dirty, yeah. I can't sleep. Yeah. Right. So prioritizing in that case, somebody to come clean for you, to right. clean your kitchen or to communicate to the people that are supporting you. Look, this is the one thing I was on bed rest with my daughter and I sat at the sofa on the sofa all day, right at counter level. <laughs> if my counters weren't clean, yeah. I was like, so yeah. paying attention to whatever that is for you. Absolutely. Because for each of us, that's different so that you can prioritize that sleep. Because I hear people say all the time, oh, I hear that, but you know, who can sleep? Well, you can right. if you find out what your triggers for not sleeping are and resolve them. Yes, so true. And, and I tell parents, you know, we also as adults need to focus on our sleep hygiene. So, you know, you're mentioning like, I know I need my counters clean. So, you know, how can you get that done? But if we are tired enough, we should be able to sleep during the day in those early days when we're not sleeping as much at night. So focusing on your sleep hygiene, focusing on what you know you need to get done in order to feel good can definitely be helpful. Absolutely. You have shared some really fabulous takeaways for our audience um, who not only watch this live, but get to watch it on replay. Um, and it goes up on our YouTube and a couple other places also. So there'll be lots of access to this. Before we wrap up, Lauren, is there any one final tip that you'd love to share with our audience? You know, I my main passion, my main goal in working with parents is just follow your instincts. There is so much information out there, especially if you're on Instagram and social media. Unfollow people that don't serve you um, and just try to drown out your well-meaning sister-in-law or what your mom did 35 years ago. Maybe, maybe it was great, but your instincts are telling you exactly what you and that baby need. If you can tap into them, you will have all of the answers that, that, that you need. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I was talking to somebody recently who said their next door neighbor actually knocked on their door and said, you know, I heard your baby wake up last night. And, you know, I just thought I would share with you when my baby was little, um, we just let them figure it out. Oh no. And, and she said, Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. I so appreciate it. But you know, we've decided this is how we want to support our baby. <laughs> and, and I was just like, literally somebody came and knocked on your door. Oh and it's not like she lives in an apartment building. She lives <laughs> in a house. That is so, I mean, yeah, that is it's like crazy. What are you doing? <laughs> Standing outside my window at three in the morning? <laughs> right. But anyway, Lauren, thank you so much for joining us on Real Talk. Um, it's an honor to have you. Um, it's an honor to get to share more with our audience about being more attached, more respondent, responsive to emotions, acknowledging that there's lots of different things. I love that. That was, for me, that's the big takeaway. There's lots of different things to do that can make a difference rather than it only has to be one way. Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciate that. Thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And thank you to our audience for joining us on Real Talk tonight. If you have any questions about this topic or anything related to sleep and wanna have a chat with Lauren, put them in the feed and tag her or tag Newborn Care Solutions. We'll make sure you get answers. And as always, you can catch replays of this and all of our other episodes on our YouTube channel by putting Newborn Care Solutions Real Talk into the search engine. And you can find them by going to newborncaresolutions.com and clicking on the education tab. Thanks so much for joining us and have a fantastic night. Good night.